I think that there is no single face that is more representative of the decade of the 90s than Macaulay Culkin. He's like the icon of that decade. And every, I think, millennial who grew up in the 90s uh, watching Home Alone every year at Christmas knows that, right? He's sort of frozen in time. Even though we know he must have grown up, he's still Kevin McAllister. Did you know that, uh, you wouldn't be surprised to know, that uh, Macaulay Culkin was Hollywood's highest paid kid for more than a decade, earning over $8 million per movie. It's a lot of money for a little kid. Well, probably not totally surprising, and maybe you remember this splayed on the headlines of the tabloid papers, his then newfound wealth spawned an awful family situation that has continued to this day. His father was his manager, and he tried to make a power play to take full control of his son's fortune. Well, his mom didn't care for that, and so it caused, ultimately, his parents to separate. When that dragged on and eventuated in a messy public divorce, there were extensive legal battles, both for the money and the custody of the children, which also were on the front page of the National Enquirer. The thing all ended up in a big train wreck when Macaulay Culkin had to sue his own parents to keep them away from his money, resulting in their losing all rights to his income and their family being irreparably fractured. This is an all too common scene. Childhood star, newfound wealth, family explosion. It plays out on so many fronts. No sports fan can forget the story of Kobe Bryant's ascent and then his mom secretly selling off his high school trophies and buying a house for herself. They still haven't reconciled. There is an unrivaled power to money. An unrivaled power. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. The unrivaled power of money. Second Chronicles 31 tells the story of King Hezekiah. And if you were around here in the fall, you may remember our series called Legacy, where we looked at several kings in Israel's history as examples of negative or positive legacies. The decisions they were making, perhaps unbeknownst to them at the time, had vast repercussions on their heritage and established, for better or for worse, a family legacy. Hezekiah was the shining example of a legacy done carefully and done right. He built a legacy of reform, of revival, drawing not only his family, but the nation of Israel under his leadership, back to faithfulness to God. The word of God reads, when the festival ended, the Israelites who attended, now that was the festival that Hezekiah called and invited the nation together to celebrate, commemorating their return to serving the Lord. All who attended smashed all the sacred pillars, cut down the Asherah poles, and removed the pagan shrines and altars. And this, of course, particularly the Asherah pole, became an icon of its own for the legacy, for worse, and then cutting it down as the beginning of a new legacy, being the ones who perhaps in our lap around the track of our family's history decide, this doesn't go on any longer. You shall not pass. Well, look what happened as the story continued from there. In verse 4, the Word of God teaches, In addition, Hezekiah required the people in Israel to bring a portion of their goods to the priests and Levites so they could devote themselves fully to the law of the Lord. Even in their return to God, discovery of His Word, restoring of prescribed temple worship and cutting down of the Asherah poles and removing of the idolatrous worship venues, there was still more to be done for wholehearted devotion. And so they could devote themselves fully to God. He asked them to bring some of their stuff to the temple. When the people of Israel heard these requirements, they responded generously. 
by bringing the first share of their grain, new wine, olive oil, honey, and the produce of their fields. They brought a large quantity, a tithe of all they produced. So this was a new concept to the people. They had long since lost and forgotten the word of the Lord. And so when Hezekiah told them what God asked of them in worship, they responded enthusiastically. The big idea here is that God's institution of the tithe is designed to demonstrate our wholehearted devotion to him. It's designed by God for the specific purpose of allowing us to demonstrate wholehearted devotion to him. The tithe is a filter for lip service Christianity and for feel-good religion and for half-hearted devotion. Pastor Robert Morris has done such a good job writing about this embattled subject with fresh life and balance. And in his book, The Blessed Life, he wrote clearly from the Bible's standpoint, we need to understand money and how to handle it. Why? Because money is actually a test from God. How you handle money reveals volumes about your priorities, loyalties, and affections. In fact, it directly dictates many of the blessings you will or won't experience in life. At this point, having mentioned the word tithe, there is a collective inhale, at least among some, in any church gathering, and a a sort of tensing up that happens. And so many of us grew up in or around church and have heard more than our share of messages about money, giving, and the tithe, and perhaps it was done inartfully or downright abusively. And pressure and guilt were applied. And so we hear this subject once a year in church and you know, we sit there politely, but in our minds, we close the blast doors, you know, like close the blast doors, close the blast doors. But before you close, let's like a Star Wars thing. <laughs> before you close the blast doors, I, I'm asking if you'll give me 28 more minutes. All right. And, and if not, then, you know, do what you want. That's okay. You are free, Um, but I hope you will. We're in a series called Begin, where we're starting the year at a time that people are more open to new rhythms and reformations in their personal order than other times in the year. It's a natural rhythm for establishing new habits of the heart. And so we're looking at five of them. Over the first couple of weeks, We looked at the Word of God and how it challenged us to begin first to understand your heart. And then last week, begin submitting to authentic community. And this week, our challenge is this. Begin honoring God with your finances. For our text, we're going to look at Malachi chapter 3. This is the most comprehensive text, a thesis, if you will, in all of Scripture on the subject of the tithe, and so it seems that we should look there if we're going to try to make sense out of it and perhaps redeem this embattled notion. Malachi 3 teaches, ever since the time of your forefathers, you've turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? And God, it seems, answers their question with a question. Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? His answer, in tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord." I want to unpack this and dig in on a couple of verses in it to try to make sense of it. Verse 8 says, Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. So he puts their 
failing to tithe and keep this one particular spiritual discipline in the context of thievery. And you ask, how do we rob you? He says in tithes and offerings. The reason that this is characterized by God as robbing from him is that Scripture has already made clear the first tenth of what we produce belongs to God. Where does that come from? Well, it's in the law of Moses, most succinctly summarized in Deuteronomy chapter 14, where he says, you must set aside a tithe of your crops, one-tenth of all you harvest each year. And tithe, first, is simply a transliteration of an Englishifying, if you will, of a Hebrew word which simply means tenth or ten percent. And he says, bring a tithe or a tenth of your crops. And that's, of course, their metric of income in an agrarian economy, as was theirs. Moses further qualifies what that tithe ought to look like in Exodus 23 when he says, as you harvest your crops, this is in the context of that five-chapter download of God's instructions about what it means to live in relationship with him and be a people set apart for God, right? So Moses is up on Mount Sinai in the dark. He gets the download from God to include the Ten Commandments. He comes down, gives it to the people. This comes in the context of that dissertation. He says, as you harvest your crops, bring the very best of the first harvest to the house of the Lord your God. So it's not just a tenth, it would seem, that God is interested in, but the first and best. Why is that significant that God wants our first and best? Why would he care when it comes in the month, not what's left over? I would think it's because of the, the principle that you could put in the form of a question. Is it really faith to give to God after all the bills are paid? Right now, that, that may be generous, and sacrificial, and a good offering. And I love giving gifts. I love giving gifts to missionaries. I love giving gifts to family and friends. And at the end of the month, if we have extra discretionary money, I like using it that way. But it would be um, unwise, probably, to give a birthday gift to a friend when I didn't give the gift of paying the mortgage to my family. And so you would do that after taking care of your responsibilities. That's wisdom, but God specifically asks for it out of the first and best, not the last and the leftover, because it really may not be faith to give to him once we've paid all the bills. Verse 9, he says, you are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you were robbing me. All right, this is strong language. What are we to make of this? This is pretty incendiary, no? Lots has been made out of this curse over the years and the centuries in church. And any of us who are veterans of church have probably heard it. It's been interpreted to mean thus and such, but the application is almost invariably pressure and guilt. And there's a a reasonable pushback of, hey man, I don't know that that's the way we experience God. God doesn't characterize himself comprehensively through guilt or pressure. And what about the New Testament man in grace? I I totally get that. I share it. Now, if you're new to church and you haven't heard this taught on, and you're like, what's the big deal? Well, just imagine money, which whether you're new to church or not, you understand intrinsically to be a big deal. And then think about all the movies you've seen lampooning the church and money right? And how the church really just wants to get at your money. And think about all the the cynic atheist blogs you might have read before becoming a Christian and how that's the low-hanging fruit for them. And now, um, understand that God's word evidently says that God has placed us under some sort of curse for not doing that thing of giving money to the church. And use your imagination as to why that would be pressurized among many of us. So, That is where the tension comes from. You feel it, and listen, I feel it. Because I don't want to apply pressure any more than you want to receive it. I don't enjoy the thought of making you bristle or tense up or have to pass. I'm going to stand out there afterward and be like, hey, have a great week. Thanks for coming to church. Oh, your baby's cute. I mean, all the stuff I do because I like you. I love you. And it's going to be awkward when you're like, 
this is the place where you normally say good sermon, but I don't want him to think that I think that I am going to not do that or this. I don't like that. I've been doing this for 20 years. So here's what I've learned. It, it is awkward at least, tense more probably, and uh, easier to sidestep. I don't think, though, that I do you a service if I do what is tempting for me to do, which is soften it or kind of apologize for God. Now, I can apologize for the church, and I should. And so for those of you who have had this subject inartfully or distastefully or hurtfully presented over the years of trying to follow God and find him in church, I am so sorry. That's not okay. It's not right. I, it would be hurtful. It has been hurtful to me too. And I would be mistrusting as well. And so I totally get it. And I'm so sorry that's happened. The, the temptation for me, because of the way I'm wired, is to want to like overcompensate and tippy toe around or soften or apologize for God and his word. And the problem is I wouldn't be a very good pastor to you if I did that. Because this clearly means something important to God. Uh, I can either fear God or fear you. I can't do both. And the problem is I kind of fear you a little bit. Because <laughs> I like you and I want you to like me. You're not just my congregation. You're my family. You're my friend. We're raising our kids in this church. I want you to want to go to lunch with me and stuff, right? So there's that. So if it is tense or awkward, just know that it is every bit as much so for me. Kind of like when your doctor, you know, puts on the glove. <laughs> He's like, I don't like this any more than you do. And the girls are like, I don't get it. And you're like, never mind. <laughs> All right, so here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to try and interpret the curse and say what it could mean. But at least, can we agree that it at least means this? The tithe is evidently a pretty big deal to God. Such that he would ascribe or uh, connect a curse of some sort to its not being observed. Jesus says, what sorrow awaits you Pharisees, talking to the religious hypocrites, for you're careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, stuff like that, but you ignore justice and the love of God. Listen, Jesus talking, you should tithe. Some of us say, well, it's not really a New Testament thing, or Jesus didn't teach it. Um, Jesus also didn't explicitly teach thou shalt not murder, but I think he wanted you not to do it too. But the point is he did teach this. He says just don't neglect the more important things. In other words, don't be hypocrites, hypocrites, which is kind of the point of the teaching in which this is ensconced. Bring, stop mocking me, I heard that. Ensconced, nestled, right? It's a good word. You think I can't hear you whispering about me, but I can. Good ears. <laughs> All right, verse 10. Bring the whole tithe. Would you stop laughing? This is a serious, awkward subject. I need you to treat it as such. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. And so... We'll get to the blessing, but first, in a noteworthy deviation, God actually instructs us to test him. I say noteworthy because God has elsewhere instructed us in no uncertain terms not to test him, such as in Deuteronomy 6 where he says, you must not test me. <laughs> so why would God tell us to do something he has explicitly told us not to do? It's kind of like the exception that proves the rule, right? God takes the unprecedented step of asking us on this particular spiritual discipline not to take it in faith. With this instruction, he tells us not to do the thing that it seems is what we're supposed to do. Like remember when Thomas doubted, thus earning the moniker Doubting Thomas? When he's like, I won't believe it unless I see it and put my fingers into the holes and stuff. And Jesus is like, fine, go ahead. You've seen and therefore you believe. But blessed is the one who has not seen and yet has believed. This seems to be God's way, no? Except here, where God, in a noteworthy deviation, 
asks us not to take it on faith, but offers to prove it to us. In fact, he doesn't merely offer, he instructs us, he orders us to test him. It's kind of like that movie trope that comes up every three or four years in a movie where like the boss or the Jedi master or the sensei is like, okay, to his, to his adoring pupil who lives in fear of him, I want you to hit me as hard as you can. I couldn't hit you, sensei. No, you need to hit me. I don't want to hit you. Hit me. And he's like, eh. He's like, no, really hit me. Uh, come on, hit me. Whack. You know that movie? Can you kind of intuitively play that one out, right? It's like God saying, I want you to hit me. And you're like, I'm not going to do that. No, no, no. Hit me as hard as you can. Thou shalt not test the Lord. Okay, except here, I want you to test me. Um, I watched what you did to people who did stuff you didn't want them to do, like in the Old Testament. You know, the whole opening of the earth and swallowing of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. I'm, I'm good. No, no, no. Test me in this. It's like, I want you to hit me as hard as you can. That's the thing, right? Do you see this? This tension is here. What are we supposed to make of this? Clearly, it's a big deal to God because he uses the stick and the carrot. He motivates them with like, you better or else you're under a curse. And then he motivates them with the incentive, right? Test me in this, says the Lord, and see if I won't throw open the floodgates. Pour out so much blessing, you won't have enough room for it. Verse 11, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops. And the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land. He heavily incentivizes their obeying him in this thing. So it is pressurized on both sides. So what we see is that tithing is such a big deal to God that he, one, instructs us to do what he has, in fact, instructed us otherwise not to do. Thus, inviting the contradictions in scripture critique, right? Do you know what I'm talking about? Like um, every pseudo um, Richard Dawkins atheist loves to point out how scripture's full of contradictions. Like, do you have a job? Is there a water cooler? Do you ever talk to someone over the water cooler who knows you're a Christian? And they're like, you actually believe that stuff because the Bible's like so full of contradictions. They're like, really? I've never heard that before. But Jesus, to their sort of simple-minded defense, kind of invites that critique, right? So you got that ditch on this side of the road. And then two, he incentivizes us to obey him in a way that can be misinterpreted, almost like begs to be misinterpreted as like the prosperity gospel. Do you know what I mean by that? I say this sort of pretending that I'm wearing $350 eel skin shoes. And it's like this. Okay, it's time for offering. Hold your offering up. Come on, stand up. Hold it up in faith. Who's got? Come on. Come on, somebody. Mm-hmm. All right, now, what's we going to do? So George and Daniel are going to be up here, and you just go ahead and bring your offering up here and lay it at the apostles' feet. Come on. As we give you the 25-minute offering sermon. All right, now I've got my green hanky. I'm going to wave it over you. And now come here. Come here. Bless. You're blessed. It's a, it's a, there's two fingers. You're blessed. Okay. And so all that, there's all that. And if there's anything that grates the Denver Christian sensibility based on the million conversations I have with you all, it's the prosperity gospel. Because it's phony baloney. It's like, it's trying to, to say, hey, just, just give more. I think, what's that? Somebody, somebody's supposed to give $1,000. And there's a healing waiting for you. You know, it's just that. And there may be, in fact, a healing waiting for somebody. And you may, in fact, be supposed to give $1,000. But the overlinking of the two, it, it creates such a bad taste. It's like chewing whole packs of gum with the artificial sweetener. After like five minutes, you're like, this is terrible. <laughs> so there's the, that ditch on that side of the road. So you got God allowing the thing to run the risk of being misinterpreted One way over here with the stick and being misinterpreted another way over there with the carrot. It's clear, at least, perhaps uncomfortably clear, that God really wants us to tithe. Can we at least agree on that? Now, whether you really want to tithe and will is uh, between you and him. 
but he's clear that he really wants us to. And so I guess my question is, why? Isn't that the question that we as intellectually honest students of Scripture have to ask here? Of all the guidance God gives us, why is he so strong and emphatic with this one? I think maybe the beginning of that answer is found in Jesus' words in Matthew 6. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is will be also. Did you know that there are around 500 verses in the Bible on prayer? Makes sense? Sounds about right? Almost as many on faith. There are over 2,000 verses in Scripture on money and possessions. Jesus talked about money in 16 of his 38 parables, almost half of his teachings. With the whole world of topics and three years to try and communicate God's truth. You know, like, well, Jesus is a money guy, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I've been to churches where they talk about it every week. <laughs> yeah, but that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, think about it. It's ironic because Jesus didn't seem circumstantially, like in his own life, to care very much about money. He treated it with almost a sort of casual indifference. Do you remember the story, and I won't read it for the sake of time, where they're going into, I think it was Capernaum, Peter's hometown, and so Peter's like wanting to make sure that they're doing right because it's his hometown, and the temple tax collector comes to him and is like, are you guys going to pay the tax? And, and he's like, Rabbi, we're in my hometown, are we going to pay the tax? And Jesus is like, tax? Oh, yeah. You know what? Just, I'll tell you what. Go down and fish in the lake, and the first fish you bring up, pull it off the line, open its mouth, and reach in, and you'll find some money in there, and then that'll be enough to go pay the tax. And they're like, huh? And they did it, and sure enough, he's like, oh my gosh, Bartholomew, check it out. Selfie. <laughs> Me with the fish with the money in his mouth. And then later on, I'd be playing it cool, but later on, I'd all be like, Jesus, that thing you did with the fish and the money, that was awesome. Let's do that again like 5,000 times. There's a lot of fish in the Sea in, of Galilee, and we're set. You don't even have to die on the cross. We'll just buy your position of authority. But Jesus is like, hey, there's some fish in a mouth somewhere. He's like, he, when he sends them out two by two, he's like, don't take any money. They're like, don't take any money. He, he doesn't, he seems to be the anti-money guy, yet he teaches about it so much. What do you make of that? Jesus has been made into the poverty guy and the prosperity guy. You know, like the, you have to sell all your possessions and give it to the poor and then come follow me and you'll have treasure in heaven. Oh, so that's the thing. To really be right with God, we got to be in poverty. Jesus has been made, kind of forced into that mold. And then he's been made into the prosperity guy. You know, like good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Pouring out into your lap. Have you ever noticed anyone who ever teaches that or quotes that one? It's always in thy bosom. They always go King James right at that point. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall falleth into thy bosom. I'm like, I don't really want a measure of anything in my bosom. Can it just like, <laughs> can it be in my wallet? Would that be all right? But just, we get real religious and pious when we talk about that. So we made Jesus into the prosperity guy. We put him into our mold. But I don't think Jesus was the prosperity guy or the poverty guy. Jesus' concern, I don't think, is that you be poor or rich. It is that you be whole. That's a good place to say amen. God, friends, I know this about him. I don't know everything. I don't know much about him, but I know this. He is in not in need of your money. He very much wants your heart. And I think he focuses on your money so much because like nothing else on earth, your money reveals your heart. It has in our lives an unrivaled power. And so what I think this all shows us is that the tithe that God cares so much about is not really about money at all. I think it's all about trust and submission. 
That's what the tithe is all about. Trust and submission in this matter, see, means we trust and submit to God in every matter. It's like the nth case scenario in a math proof. It's about trust because money is the thing we tend to hold the closest and love the dearest. We've all heard the famous passage in Scripture that teaches that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It asks us to trust God. Do we really believe, the tithe asks, that our provision comes from God? And it smokes out our true belief system that our provision comes from our employer or the market or our cleverness or the sweat of our brow. And it's about submission. Submission. Because money has this unparalleled and unbridled power. It wields a huge influence on our inner life. And trying to manage it on your own, you're playing with fire. It's like imagine that you discover the superpower source, like the Tesseract. Thank you. You read my mind. The blue thing. I couldn't, I couldn't remember the first service either. The blue thing that from Thor's planet, right? And you discover this, or you discover a super suit, or something that gives you the game-changing ability. And, and for a few minutes or a few days, you're using it to save kittens out of trees and buses that are about to run off the road. But then you're like, dang, think what I could do with this. And you wouldn't want to. You're the best and noblest part of you would want to use it for good, but it would wield a power too great to manage, Right? That's why I think we all love superheroes as adults. That's why I think we like to go with our kids secretly to the Marvel movies. It's not the power that they have. It's the supernatural hearts that they have so much power, yet unlike us, we know, they use it only for good and for others. What we lack in ourselves, they somehow have. It's that they're super emotional heroes. And so we love that because it's not us. It's like the ring of power in Lord of the Rings. You know, he says, I, I would use it out of a desire to do good, but through me it would wield a power too great for me to contain. Money is like that. It wields a power too great for us to contain. There ought to be, friends, a healthy mistrust of our own ability to manage money because it has unrivaled power in our hearts. Yes, we ought to to want to do the best things with it. We would like to believe that the truest, noblest, rightest version of ourselves would use it in lovely ways, but we know what lurks in us. And so what do we need to do? We need to bring it under something even more powerful. And that's the submission that the tithe asks. We take something that has power that we ourselves cannot wield, and we bring it under the submission of something even more powerful. When I was in my early 20s, I, um, I had a job that was mostly exciting and then for one brief spell, terribly boring. I was in the army, paying back my scholarship, and so I spent three years blowing things up with tanks and one year sitting behind a desk making PowerPoint slides. It was awful, but that's kind of the way it works in the military. You have to spend your time doing boring administrative stuff. And so I made endless PowerPoint presentations for a general, and my mind started to atrophy. And so I got into commodities trading because it seemed fun, and I, I have a quirky curiosity about things. And so, you know, New York Stock Exchange is where, the, where stocks are traded. Well, the Chicago Commodities Exchange is where they trade commodities. And there's a whole code that I didn't know, but you're supposed to be rude. And so I called up a brokerage called Ira Epstein, and they answered, and they're like, Epstein! And I was like, hi, um, my name is Rob Brendel, and I'm looking, I'm interested in, uh, if you could please help me in opening a com What do you need? And I'm like, oh, wow, you don't have to be rude. And he, and he basically was like, rude is kind of how we do commodities. And I'm like, okay, well, then thanks for telling me, jerk. Open me an account. And he's like, now you got it. And I was like, <laughs> this is awesome. And so I, I, I got into a whole world. Do you know what commodities is? It's like, like pork bellies and cotton and hard red spring wheat. And it, did you know that our whole food supply is basically gambled on, you know, 
like how many points LeBron James is going to score. It's weird. But that's the commodities exchange. So I got way into it. And I started, and I, I lost my shirt a couple times, but then I was like, oh, come on. Bring it on, pork bellies. You will not have, be the master of me. And so then I figured the thing out, and I started making money, right? And then, and then I started making a lot of money for being 23 and having very little to spend it on. And then I started losing a lot of money and then making more money. And it was basically gambling for me. Um, and on bacon, which is weird. But, um, <laughs> but it got to the point where, you know how this story goes, because it's probably happened to you at some point in your life. It kind of took control of me. And I found out, I, I can be a little compulsive in my personality, and I got way into it. And so every break I had, I was like on the Epstein site. Um, I, was, I would go to bed at night, like checking the weather in Southeast Asia and things like this. And if, if I lost or lost, you know, didn't do well on a trade, I like lost it emotionally and was coming unglued. And if I won and made a bunch of money, I would get unnaturally euphoric. And, and this thing was running me for a little bit. I've been talking about a few months. And uh, it just, you know what broke it? And probably why I'm not in prison? Seriously. Is um, I heard this sermon. Like a semi-life-giving, pastoral, trying to be self-effacing and, you know, make a joke while putting on the rubber glove sermon about money and tithing. And I'd never heard it. And it wasn't talked about in my church growing up. And I think my parents did it, but they never told me to do it or like how it worked. And so I heard this and I was like, dang. But what my parents did teach is you go to, you, you honor the word of God and you go to church. And so I was like, oh, I've been missing this. I'm under a curse. I want to be under a curse. It's probably why pork bellies went down last week. <laughs> and so I started tithing during this time in my life. And I've never stopped. And I haven't stopped. I, I, I mean, I did get to the point where I could tolerate less risk around uh, investments. And I didn't have the time to like track the weather in Southeast Asia. Um, because my day job started asking more of me again. And I got married to a sensible wife who was like, what on earth are you doing? <laughs> so now I like buy mutual funds. But I've still continued to, you know, buy and sell real estate and other things like that. So it's not like it cured me and, and sort of gave me a lobotomy uh, around investments. It was more like um, at, when I started tithing, that thing stopped being the master of me. Because I realized once and finally who the master of me was when I submitted that final trans transcendent power to him. Does that make any sense? If not, it was therapeutic, so thank you. <laughs> so we'll close up here back to Hezekiah where we started. Remember the dude that had him cut down the Asherah poles and change their legacy? The people who had moved to Judah from Israel and the people of Judah themselves brought in the tithes of their cattle, sheep, and goats and a tithe of the things they had been dedicated, that had been dedicated to the Lord, and they piled them up in great heaps. They're like, we never knew this was a thing. We didn't know the word of God was a thing. So when he starts telling us this is what the word says, we're like, great, let's do it. So they brought them in and piled it up in the temple. And then, I love this. So there's great heaps, right? It says of goats. And so there's like, there's like soybeans and goats piled up in great heaps. It's just funny to me. I mean, it's, there's goats in the heap. I'm like, goat move out of the heap or something? But So then what happens is Hezekiah comes and sees these huge piles. They thank the Lord and then said, where did all this come from? Because it had been a little while evidently. And Hezekiah asked the priests and, and the priest replied, since the people began doing this thing you told them to do that was lost in the word of God over the millennia, since they began tithing and bringing their gifts to the Lord's temple, we have all had enough to eat and plenty to spare. Because listen, the Lord has blessed his people. And all this is what's left over, this heaps of goats left over. So what had happened was they're like, they had a pie, just like you and I have. And maybe they were living like conservatively off 50% in squirrel and some under the mattress because they saw grandma lose the farm and they're like, not me. Or maybe they're living off 100% plus a credit card, like some of us are, or somewhere in between. But they had their pie. And now all of a sudden, 10% of their pie was getting taken to the temple. And so you'd think, well, now they had less pie. But what happened is their pie got bigger, right? So they're like, all right, well, I better bring 10% of that bigger pie. So then that, but 10% of more is more. So then they bring it and the pile, the heap of goats is getting bigger because their goats are having more goats. And their crops are making more crops. 
And they said, the Lord blessed his people. We have all this left over. And they were thinking, man, we're going to sacrifice for God. We're going to get this right. We're cutting down the Asherah pole. We're getting rid of the idols over the mantle and the shrine to grandma. And we're going to tithe. And they're expected to like have to dig deep. And they're giving the kids the, the we're, we, you know, we're going to do the staycation. We're going camping this year, kids, because we're tithing. We're getting right with God. But instead, there's heaps of goats. I'm just saying that's what happened. It's exciting to me. So where do we go from here? This would be the point. The music starts playing. The pastor's voice gets wispy, and he breaks out the high-pressure timeshare sales pitch clothes. <laughs> I've got no timeshare clothes for you, though. Here's what I'd like to throw out. Here's what I suggest. Why not test God, as he said? Like, how many of you, apart from the money thing, have found God in your life to be faithful? How many of you have found God to be trustworthy? How about this? How many of you have found God to be good? How many of you have found God to be smart? Like know what he's doing. Not easily bamboozled. Not going to crash the train if he's in charge of it. Okay? So if we already know God to be this way, in a way, what have we got to lose? Haven't you already seen him be faithful? Why not test him as he said? So my point of application isn't, hey, you need to tithe for the rest of your life, or else we're going to have that awkward look away moment after church where you know that I know that I know that you know that I'm just not doing it. <laughs> Forget it, man. Even though I don't know or not know. It's not like I look at what you give or anything. But, but here's the thing. God said, test me in this. So I'm saying, test him. Like, I've got nothing for you. Don't it doesn't say test Rob or test Denver United. I've got nothing. Test God. And if it doesn't work out to your satisfaction, I suppose, I mean, the test is open-ended. It doesn't say how much you should get. So if it doesn't seem to work for you, stop. Why not test him, as he said? Because here's the thing, everyone. I think we're here, not because in this day and age and in this location, there's some social convention saying you've got to go to church. What would the neighbors think? I think if the neighbors knew you were up going to church, they'd think that you're like stuck in the 1950s. And we're not here because of religious duty. That's so like 1975. We're not here to put on a form or appease our parents. We're here, I think, from what I hear from you guys when we talk, to pursue a life with God. So if we're interested in living with God, why not begin to really do it, like all out? Especially when the begin has an out clause. Makes sense, right? Why not? What if it's that big of a deal to God because not the money but the heart? What if this is the final frontier? And what if God really is good? What if he is a loving father who wants good things for his kids just like you want good things if you have kids for them? And what if our hearts being fully submitted to him opens the floodgates of God's blessing? Now, a word of qualification on the blessing. I think we would be prudent not to expect instantaneous blessing because we live in an instantaneous culture. It may or may not be that if your test is, God, I'm going to do this, seven days, a check in the mail, or like a leprechaun on my door with a pot of gold. I, I mean, that may not happen. Maybe it will. I don't know. But it could be, it, it could be that it not happening right away is part of the blessing. Because God loves his kids too much to have them dictated to by a gratify me now culture entirely. I also like to point out that the blessings that are specifically identified in the passage are more preventative blessings. They're more like experiential or circumstantial, right? They're contextualized in the work that you do do. They're less of someone showing up with a, you know, a lottery ticket that's winning and more of stuff that you do going even better. Like, um, Pests won't devour your crops. And I think some of us have gone too long 
with too many pests devouring our crops. Because man, I work hard, I keep putting it together and then the deal falls through at the last minute. Or this one, your trees won't drop their fruit. Some of us, we've been trying and we're, we're doing it far enough that we're getting the fruit. The tree's actually growing fruit, but every time there's fruit, it drops before it can like nourish anyone. Like that relationship falls apart or moves away or the circumstance changes or the company has a down quarter for the second time in a row and my name's on the list. Like I can't get traction. I can't lose for winning. No, other way around. I can't win for losing. That's what my grandmother used to say. <laughs> and so I think the blessing is holistic. See, it's a blessed life that lives pressure and anxiety free. That lives secure, not because I am insulated against every possible eventuality, but because God is for me. There's security. There's safety. There is peace of mind in that. What's that worth to you? And then there's Proverbs 3 that says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. That's what we're talking about. And it says, then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats with, will overflow with good wine. So there, there's prosperity too. So some of you are like, yeah, I get the like, the, the snakeskin shoe thing, but cause, cause, I was hoping for a little bit of prosperity in this. Okay, well, there you go. That's your verse. <laughs> Hold on to it. No, the thing is, God knows what we need. And he gives us that and more. I think that's what Jesus was getting at. A good measure pressed down, like not skimping, running over, and then some. God knows what we need, and he gives us that and more, because we're his kids and he loves us. So then, um, I think some of us maybe have a hard time doing this thing, tithing. One, because we're like, um, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me been on this road. I'm not getting guilted and pressured anymore. Or maybe it's like, um, yeah, I, I don't know if I find that to be true of God. I don't know if it feels true to me. Okay, well, you got to figure that out. Um, but I think there's a, a bunch of us, as I've gathered talking over the years with folks about this, that maybe we don't because we can't right now. Like you are like, I can't afford it. I can't tithe without crashing the ship. Like if I gave 10% away, crash. And some of us are living on 100% of what we earn and then some. And I, I'm not, I have no judgment for you. I mean, I'm trying to figure this out myself, right? So there's no finger wagging here. I wonder though if we can't live off of 100%, I wonder if 90% is any different. so if that's you and you're like, yeah, even if I wanted to do this, and maybe I do, maybe it makes sense. I, 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 I can't. Well, then I hear, here's what I think the Word of God teaches for us. Learn to handle your finances according to God's truth. Learn to handle your finances according to God's truth, because if you start doing that, you'll find that you're less a slave to the creditor a year from now. That's a great feeling. Anyone ever experienced the feeling of getting out of debt? live in a consumer economy which would love nothing more than to keep you in debt up to your eyeballs until you're dead. Handle your finances the way God says to and you'll find that you start storing up a little surplus so that when your car needs new tires, when you take it in for the oil change and they're like, yeah, you know, we did the test and it's down to that, you, you're not calling your, your spiritual prayer partner and, and binding the devil. You know, and maybe that's a spiritual attack. Um, or maybe your car just needs new tires. Because tires, you know, wear out when they're on the road. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't pray about that, but maybe uh, you start trusting God and, and learning how to handle your finances the way His Word teaches. A year from now, you'll find that that's not such a, a life-shattering event. When your tires wear out, you'll just buy new tires because you're prepared and you have savings. 
And then you'll find that you've started storing up a little bit that might grow into a lot for later and to leave an inheritance to your children's children. What a thrill would that be? You think college is expensive now. You're like, I'm 40 and I'm still paying it off. Imagine how much it'll be for your grandkids. And you'll find more than anything, you've gained a peace in your mind where you lay down and go to sleep. Unworried. And you'll find that it's made your money go further and you actually have more. That's what I think you'll find a year from now if you start learning to handle your finances according to God's word. So how do you do that? Well, let me offer as a resource in February when our groups kick off, one of them is a a class called Financial Peace University. And it's simply a cohort model. Think of it as a a sort of hybrid of small group and meeting with a really good financial advisor. Um, And we'll look at the word of God and how it teaches us to order our finances and have a no guilt, no pressure, life-giving approach in the context of a support community. And uh, it's a great way to begin learning how to handle your finances in a way that honors God, according to his word. Uh, You'll find out more about that in the weeks ahead, so stay tuned. If God is working in your life or has worked in your life in this way, we'd love to hear about it. Uh, Pastor Darius mentioned the praise cards. There is pray on one side, praise on the other. Um, I'd love to, if you have a testimony, uh, hear what that is. You know what? This was happening in my life, and here's how I learned to trust God. I think those stories build one another up. And so uh, let's share them with each other. Would you stand with me? It's time for us to go. Father, in the name of Jesus, thanks for the truth, life, power, and hope that is in your word. Lord, teach us how how to do what you've asked us to do. But more than that, give us hearts to submit fully and to trust completely. We love you and uh, we look to you for this. It's in Jesus' name.